Welcome to B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with B News reporters Chris Flaherty, Robert Paris, Peter Brown with the weather, and Ian Cassiola with the Community Bulletin Board. Thank you for joining us. The Burlington Education Foundation has been making a difference in Burlington for years. This week they received a donation from 3rd Avenue Burlington to advance their causes. B News reporter Robert Paris was there and has this report. The Burlington Education Foundation has been around for many years contributing to multiple fundraisers and organizations in Burlington. Last week at 3rd Ave, they received a donation from the Nordblum Company. Nordblum has been a partner of the Burlington Ed Foundation for many, many years, since its existence, actually. And um, with the onset of 3rd Ave, um, they invited us to be a community partner with them um, on, at their Taste of 3rd Ave for this year. It was a great way to um, support the businesses that actually support us. Um, invite our community to the event and have them participate and um, take advantage of everything that's so good about 3rd Ave. Paula Bormeister, president of the BEF, has been at the foundation since the beginning. Since its inception, actually, um, I got involved helping them to create a fundraiser for the spring in their inception year and soon thereafter started um, as a board member and um, about five or six years ago took over as president so and I've been involved ever since. So how will this donation help benefit the Burlington Educational Foundation? So as I said North Bloom's always been very generous but this gave us an opportunity to increase that um, donation and um, really provide better for our school system and we've noticed more recently in the past few years that our grants um, have increased in number and in the number of dollars requested. So this goes a long way in helping us meet that need. The BEF is continually grateful for the generous support from the Burlington business community. I'd just like to say thank you again to Nord Bloom and the community um, and helping us raise the funds that are required of the school system. It's been a pleasure um, providing for the school system in all of the unique and different ways that our grants have come to play out. So, um, and I appreciate the teachers that are requesting them and the uh, results that we've seen with all of the different programs. From 3rd Ave, I'm Robert Paris for B News Weekly. In other 3rd Avenue news, entertainment will be coming to Redstone American Bar and Grill. A six-month entertainment license was approved for the restaurant at a recent Board of Selectmen meeting. The license grants solo acoustic music performances on the patio on Wednesday nights from 7 to 9 p.m. A Redstone representative explained that they hope it's something that will drive sales and be a great asset. Town Administrator John Petron expressed concern about the music bleeding out to the neighboring 3rd Avenue establishments. He instructed Redstone to make sure the music is directed inward so that it's contained more in the restaurant because the patio was right across the street from other restaurants. Redstone fully agreed and wants to be respectful of its 3rd Avenue neighbors. The Board of Selectmen unanimously approved the vote. The license will expire in January, which time Redstone will need to renew their license. If the entertainment is a success, Redstone would need to return to the board to request additional evenings as well. Miter, summer is in full swing. However, New England, along with the perfect beach days, also comes tropical storms and hurricane season. B News reporter Chris Flaherty caught up with our meteorologist, Peter Brown, for an in-depth look at what we can expect this season. Welcome back to our Weather Center. We're joined once again by the best weatherman in town, Peter Brown. How are you, my friend? I'm great, Chris. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. Good to see you. How's your summer going so far? It's going pretty well, and I've got to say it's been been really nice weather, which I'm kind it of pleasantly surprised. Thank you for that. My pleasure. My machine is working well. Yes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so with every summer, there's a chance for summer storms, right? Absolutely. What's going on with our buddy El Nino? Okay, well, I'm glad, you're glad you mentioned that because El Nino is a real driving factor in how busy the hurricane season is going to be for right. us. And, you know, not only for just, you know, the southeast like people think about, but all the way up here to the Burlington area as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's going on out there in the uh, Pacific? Okay. All right, well, as you can see here on this graphic behind me, this is mm -hmm. basically, this is a look at what the sea surface temperatures in the mm -hmm. Pacific Ocean are right now. Right. Now, when you have a really strong El Nino pattern, you would see all of this warm water heading way over here to the west coast of South America. Right. And that 
that's usually what helps to you know diminish hurricane season quite a bit because it causes a lot of wind shear that travels over into the Atlantic. However, on this graphic, as you'll notice, over towards Ecuador and everything in the right. coast of Peru, mm -hmm. the water is actually much colder than normal. So, mm -hmm. in terms of say, if we were to say you know see a lot of spike of activity coming off of the coast of Africa with tropical waves, mm -hmm. it would be a prime time for storms to really develop without that wind shear present. Right. Now, what about um his significant other? I'll say. <laughs> El Nino. <laughs> All right, so what we usually call um, La Nina is actually mm -hmm. the reverse of El Nino. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is we see actually much colder water, even colder than what we're seeing right now off okay. the coast of Western South America develop. Mm -hmm. And that pushes all of the warm water way, way over towards, say, Guam and the Philippines and everything. Mm -hmm. Now when that happens, that completely cuts all of the wind shear off that's going over towards the Atlantic. And that allows these big, big, huge convective thunderstorms coming off of Africa mm -hmm. to really start to coalesce together and to mm -hmm. form hurricanes. So if you have a strong La Nina pattern, which we're thankfully doesn't look like we're going to be going into, mm -hmm. that's something that would be a real driving factor in the in uptick of a hurricane season. Wow, OK. Mm -hmm. So what do we have next for our uh, weather report? OK, well, this map right here, this is something that a lot of people will be it's very interesting to look at. It's a nice graphic from the National Hurricane Center, and this mm -hmm. basically shows how many hurricane strikes we've had per coastal county in the Northeast going back all the way to 1900. Wow. So, of course, um, when you look on the map here, you see a couple of hot spots, which would be mm -hmm. expected. Any of these pieces of land that really jut out into the ocean, so mm -hmm. say Long Island up to Cape Cod and then Plymouth County and everything, those mm -hmm. are the areas in the Northeast that have seen the brunt of hurricanes over mm -hmm. the past, say, 100 to 120 years. And of course, mm -hmm. Any hurricane that's hitting even Plymouth County is going to be close enough to do a lot of damage here in Burlington, that's mm -hmm. for sure. So basically, if you're on the shore, you're out of luck. And that's for sure, yeah. If you, have your, if you have your beach chair out, you're going to be going out with the fishes. <laughs> Better look out for Jaws. Uh -oh. <laughs> so. That warm weather can't be too good for the water. Well, that's the thing, too, and a lot of people mention that. You know, they ask me, you know, well, what is the really, really warm weather going to mean for us in mm -hmm. terms of hurricanes, especially as we go into August and getting into the start of September? And there's a couple of different things that actually happen is if mm -hmm. we actually have a lot of, say, southwesterly winds. Mm -hmm. So you say you can imagine on the graphic here winds coming from the southwest or the west. Okay. That'll tend to sometimes push the warmer water back out to sea, and that will actually allow for a lot of what we call upwelling of cold water below. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a really hot, dry summer can actually mean much colder water off the shore for us, which actually can aid us. Mm -hmm. But when you get into summers like we saw last year, summers like we see in the past, where it's kind of been, you know, moderate, and you see more southerly winds coming, like, mm -hmm. due up from the Gulf Stream, mm -hmm. that can actually jam all of the warm water up against the south coast, and that can bring a pretty strong hurricane all the way up to here. Interesting. So that'll keep all those sharks far away from Oh, us. absolutely, yes. No <laughs> need to. You can dip your toes in the water. <laughs> all right. You can watch Jaws and not worry. It's going to happen That's right. in real life. <laughs> so what do we have for our final graphic? Okay, so the next graphic that we're going to show you is actually going to be outlining how many major hurricanes mm -hmm. coastal counties in the northeastern United States have seen. Mm -hmm. And as you can probably guess from that graphic, there's really not too much. The, of course, mm -hmm. the waters are much colder here than they are, say, in the southeast. You know, mm -hmm. we see... Typically, on an average summer, the warmest the water gets is maybe 75 or 76 degrees. Right. And you need to have a sea surface temperature of 80 degrees or warmer to sustain a really strong hurricane. Mm -hmm. But interesting to note, if you look down in Plymouth County and Bristol County, down right. south of us here, mm -hmm. actually, these are locations that over the past 120 years have only seen maybe about seven or eight direct hurricane strikes. Wow. But almost 40% of them have been from major hurricanes. So that's something that's a little bit... People think about it saying, well, if New England's seen a lot of hurricanes, shouldn't the you know, vast majority should be very weak storms? Mm -hmm. And actually, it's not the case. When we get a hurricane strike in New England, it's a hurricane that really has teeth with it, that's for sure. Yeah. So to wrap, wrap it up, bring it home, what does mm -hmm. this mean for Burlington and the local area in the coming months? Okay, well, like I said, looking back at that El Nino graphic, if we were to see all of a sudden a sudden uptick in um, waves coming off of the mm -hmm. West African coast, Without that wind shear there, you know, it could be pretty active for us here in the Burlington area. But mm -hmm. the Climate Prediction Center and the National Hurricane Center are actually trying to see a trend towards this El Nino, this warm water heading mm -hmm. back towards South America when we get towards, say, the beginning of September. Mm -hmm. So that could mean, you know, we'd be thinking about all these big storms maybe heading to the Burlington area, and that might help to kind of knock the, you know, knock all the stuffing out of the hurricane, so to say. So we might actually be in a fairly good position in terms of that. 
Very nice. Now just to compare to last <coughs> summer, we were in a drought last year. How mm -hmm. are we doing so far this year? We're actually doing extremely well because I know that we've been following that on BCAT with the weather the past, especially going back nine months, following it, you know, every few right. weeks to see. Mm -hmm. And actually most of, you know, all of Massachusetts is now out of drought officially. So you can imagine where we were this time last year when the lake beds were almost dry and everything. Oh, yeah. They're actually all full and there are actually some areas that have seen more than average rain. Mm -hmm. So if you can believe we've made it all up. Oh yeah, the common's nice and green now compared to last year. Yeah, I remember last year it was nice and crunchy when we were out there for <laughs> Celebrate Burlington. It was just like crunchy, your bowl of cereal in the morning. Yep. <laughs> well, there are plenty of nice little floats and rides to make it look more colorful. Absolutely, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and that's August 5th, remember folks, Celebrate that's Burlington. Right. Peter and, and I will be there. And we will have perfect weather, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right, Peter, thank you so much for all this information. This was really great. Hey, great, Chris. Thanks for so much for asking the questions and so we can get the information out there for everybody. Absolutely. And folks, hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. And we're going to send it back to the news desk. MITRE, a nonprofit organization that operates research and development centers sponsored by the federal government, is expanding from its current campus headquarters in Bedford to across the street in Town Line and into Burlington. The Nordbund Company announced last month they have completed a 43,000 square foot lease with the MITRE Corporation. According to Peter Sherlock, MITRE Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, the MITRE technical staff continues to grow as demands increase for new research and development work in areas such as cybersecurity and healthcare. The building at 201 Burlington Street is in close proximity to the Bedford location and offers employees a variety of amenities while serving as an extension of the current campus. 201 Burlington Road consists of two connected office buildings totaling 135,000 square feet, Nordblom states. The buildings have received considerable improvements, including a complete demo two-structure renovation, which features a two-story atrium lobby, a new metal facade, energy-efficient windows, advanced systems, and new la landscape work. Nordblom has also invested in a new on-site cafe, bike storage, and shower locker facilities to create a high-end office campus. Nearby amenities, of course, include a wide range of restaurants and retail, as well as MBTA bus service at the front door, accessing both Lowell and Alewife train stations. It also features close proximity to the Route 128, Route 3 Tech Corridor. Alexander Schnipp, Vice President at Nordblom Company, welcomes MITRE to a growing list of prestigious companies in the exciting campus and notes that MITRE has a long-standing history as a successful and well-respected organization in our market. State Senator Barbara Letalian and uh, Middlesex Sheriff Peter J. Katusian announced the legislature has appropriated $250,000 in the FY 2018 fiscal budget, a fiscal year budget, for a pilot program to establish a restoration center in Middlesex County. Senator Ken Donnelly, the late Senator Ken Donnelly, had originally sponsored the budget request prior to his passing in April of this year. The Restoration Center would provide greater opportunity for law enforcement and the courts to divert those with mental illness and or substance use disorders away from the criminal justice system prior to arrest or adjudication. The center would help support ongoing law enforcement diversionary efforts in nearly two dozen Middlesex communities while also expanding the community capacity for treatment. Senator Letalian explained her reason for filing the amendment is because mental health and addiction should be treated as a public health issue. Instead of criminalizing the disease of addiction, we must treat the victims of the opioid crisis, which is hitting Middlesex County particularly hard, with rehabilitation and support, she said. Sheriff Katusian reported that last year, 42% of those entering the, his custody required medical detox and 46% reported a history of mental illness. He explained that the money for this initiative will help determine how to effectively break the cycle of incarceration by diverting more individuals away from incarceration and into treatment. Have you noticed any colorful painted rocks hidden around Burlington? Don't worry, the Easter Bunny isn't working in the off season and it's not a tech-free version of Pokemon Go. It's the activity of a new community group called Burlington Mass Rocks. B News reporter Chris Flaherty went in search of some of these rocks and came back with this report. Let's have a look. If you've been out and about town, you might have 
noticed some unique looking rocks hidden amongst the trees and landmarks. It's all part of a new community group called Burlington Mass Rocks. I spoke with the creator of the group, Lauren Lytle. Well, we were on vacation. Uh, we were down in Florida with my stepmother-in-law and my, and my, step, my father-in-law. And they were painting rocks. She had joined the Lakeland Rocks down there. And it was an activity that we were doing by, by the pool. And um, I loved it so much. We had so much fun. It was very relaxing. And she said, you should start one up in Burlington. So I said, OK, let's do it. Um, you can either, if you really love a rock, you can keep it, put it in your collection, display it, whatever you like. Um, or you can rehide it someplace new. Or um, you can just leave it alone and just leave it there for someone else to find. Anyone can paint. Um, I paint, my daughter paints, my mother's been painting, even my husband's painted a few rocks. What's your favorite part about painting the rocks? Um, when we do the colors and design the rock. Mm -hmm. We don't do the same, so it works for a view hole with different like rocks. Beautiful. What are some of the types of rocks you paint? Poop emoji. <laughs> Did you hide that one somewhere already? No, I, no. I'm working on mine that I'm going to hide, but mom, the one that mommy made, I'm keeping. Lauren gave me some tips for anyone looking to paint their own rocks. Um, you can find rocks out and about on the ground, or you can go to someplace like Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, the kind of rocks that I like to use are the Caribbean um, rocks. They're white and they're very smooth, um, so they allow for a better painting surface. All you have to do is rinse them off, and then you dry them off a little bit, and then they have a really good painting surface. Um, but you can find a rock out on the ground. Um, the ones that are sort of rough and bumpy are a little harder to paint, though. We use acrylic paint to paint. You can use small paintbrushes or things like that. What I usually do is I um, paint the background of the rock to give it a nice base coat, and then I'll use these really thin um, painting pens to do the detail work. So where are the best places to look for and hide rocks? You can hide them all around town um, in public places. So you can't hide them on like someone's yard or someone's property without their express permission. Um, but you can go to any of the parks or um, you know, in front of town hall, things like that, like public places. Um, some people have hidden them at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> the best places are places that are still kind of obvious, but kind of tucked away, like in between a couple of tree roots or something like that. I asked Lauren what she hopes she and other residents of Burlington can take away from the activity. I want people to have fun, and I was trying to join the community a little bit, you know, trying to get everybody to bond over something unique and different and fun and simple, nothing that takes a lot of money or something that, you know, requires a ton of time. You do it when you want, and it's relaxing and it's fun, and it's something that the kids can get involved in, and the elderly and regular adults who are busy with work and, and don't have a lot of time to do something. It's, it's something fun you can just do as a group. If you'd like to join in on the fun, look for the group Burlington Mass Rocks on Facebook, and keep a sharp eye out while you're outside this summer. Until next time, this is Chris Flaherty for B News Weekly. Okay, that's our B News contribution to Burlington Rocks. Students of the Cadets, a Drum and Bugle Corps program of youth and education in the arts, took a day to rehearse at Burlington High School. B News reporter Robert Paris went down to Varsity Field to check it out. If you drove down Cambridge Street last week, you probably noticed a group of young men and women practicing on Varsity Field. These talented young adults belong to a performance group called the Cadets. We are the Cadets Drum and Bugle Corps. We're based out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. We are a program offering of Youth Education in the Arts, which is a nonprofit company based there. Um, we are comprised of 150 students uh, that range from 18 to 22 years old. Uh, they're a performance-based art group, and we are here today for a rehearsal day. The Cadets have been a Drum and Bugle Corps since the early 20th century. This group itself has been around since 1934 and uh, have grown um, exponentially throughout the years. Uh, we're actually celebrating an anniversary this year. Each corpse is comprised of different style of music ensembles. So mainly uh, is percussion, uh, brass, and color guard. Uh, this year with the addition of a vocal ensemble as well. The cadets are made up of various students throughout the globe. A lot of these marching members uh, are from across the world. So we do have marching members from Japan, from Germany, uh, 
uh, main contingent from here in the United States uh, in three specific areas, uh, actually four this year. The group never gets time off as they practice every other day and travel in the U.S. throughout the entire summer. We do about 14,000 miles uh, in the course of our 60-day tour. Um, they move in in early May and they finish in late August. The performances across the country travel from, we start in Indianapolis and we head here. We're on our way to Florida now. We'll go through Texas and Oklahoma and we'll circle back up the East Coast and end up in Indianapolis for our finals in um, mid-August. If you are interested in enjoying the cadets or would like to see their various programs and their organization, then go to jointhecadets.org or you can also go to yea.org. From Burlington High School, I'm Robert Paris for B News Weekly. Let's go now to our weather center for the latest forecast from B News weatherman Peter Brown. We'll also check out the community calendar with Ian Cassiola to see what's happening in Burlington. Hello everyone and this is Peter Brown with a look at your weather for the next seven days. And here we are, we're already into the middle of July, can you believe it already? As we start out our period this coming Thursday, you're going to notice actually temperatures a little bit below normal. We're going to see actually some fairly pleasant conditions, temperatures only in the upper 70s. However, we're going to see quite a bit of humidity as we start out our period. So if you have to be outside at all, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable out there for you. Um, but like you said, like we said, the average high is supposed to be in the low 80s at this time of the year. We're not going to be anywhere near our record highs or near our record lows, that's for sure. As you can see here as we head in towards the end of the period, actually July 19th, if you can believe it, is meteorologically speaking the warmest day of the year here in the Burlington area. So that's sure marked by this high average high of 84. Uh, after that, the temperatures, if you can believe it, start their very long, long slide down. But we won't talk about that, that's for sure. As you can notice here, our days are still so nice and long right now. They're starting to get a little bit shorter now, now that we've passed the first official day of summer. So that's something to keep in mind, but we have lots of great summer weather ahead, that's for sure. As we move ahead, I'm going to show you a little bit about what's going to be going on with our weather for the next seven days. Now, starting out our period on Thursday, there's going to be this pesky stationary front that's going to be set up basically from just east of Nantucket all the way out into the Midwest. And what that means is, we're going to see some, um, some unsettled weather, especially the first half of our um, period, really not breaking until maybe we get into the Sunday time frame or so. So with this front kind of moving back and forth over us here in the Burlington area, we're going to see a chance of some pretty heavy showers and thunderstorms each day until we get to about the end of Saturday. Um, as we get into Sunday, this front's going to slowly slide onto the south and kind of fizzle away and disappear. And that's going to allow some warm weather to then come back up into our area as we get in towards the beginning of next week. But just keep in mind, though, it's a chance for some heavy showers and thunderstorms every day, really, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So keep that in mind if you have to be out and around, that's for sure. As we go ahead, I'm going to show you a little bit about what's going on in the tropics as well. And there's really not much going on, which is a great bit of news if you're going on a cruise anywhere, out to Bermuda or down to the Caribbean. No bad weather to worry about. There's just a couple of swirls out here in the middle Atlantic, which is with the remains of what was a depression a couple of days ago. That's going to be heading back out to sea, and it doesn't look like anything organized is going to really be coming off of the coast of Africa and coming anywhere near us in the next 10 to 15 days. So, again, if you're on vacation traveling down to all these areas down the tropics and the Caribbean, looks like your weather's going to be fairly nice. Now, as we go ahead, I'm going to show you about how nice our weather's going to be as we get on towards the uh, beginning of next week. Now, here you're going to notice, um, starting out our period Thursday, we're going to see the chance of some spotty heavy showers and downpours around with temperatures in the upper 70s with a lot of high humidity. Now as we get into Friday, Friday's going to be kind of a real gray day. It's going to be more reminiscent of a April day really instead of July day. We're going to see cooler conditions. Actually this high of 72 that I'm forecasting may be a little bit high. We may not see temperatures on Friday get out of the mid 60s here in the Burlington area and that's going to of course bring some showery weather again with it. As we get into Saturday though, we're going to see the return of some more warmth and a little bit more humidity as that front kind of moves around over us. It's going to bring us some showers and thunderstorm chances again. But look at this. Once we get to the end of the weekend, Sunday, look at beautiful weather. Temperatures in the low and mid-80s with ample sunshine, just a few passing clouds. 
As we get towards the end of the period, we're going to see that chance of some showers and thunderstorms here and there scattered around. But temperatures, look at this, as we get in towards the end of the period again, we're going to see temperatures up in the upper 80s again. So getting warm again out there, getting a little bit sticky as we get towards Tuesday and Wednesday. But overall, not too bad of a pattern. Just again, remember to dodge some of those showers if you're out and around the Burlington area starting out Thursday and Friday. But everyone, get out there and enjoy the great summer weather that we have and have a great week. Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Nicole. And we're here to remind you about summer reading at the Burlington Public Library. Our programs, Reading a World of Fantasy and Fantastic Reads, begin July 6th. And you can earn prizes for reading. Open to children from birth through high school, we have a little something for everyone. In addition to earning prizes, we also have all kinds of cool events. This year, our summer reading theme is fantasy, which means we'll spend the summer drinking tea with the Mad Hatter, playing Quidditch with Harry Potter, partying with princesses, training at Camp Half-Blood, And you can too. To find out how you can participate, stop by the library or visit us online at burlingtonpubliclibrary.org. See you this summer. community calendar. First up, the concerts on the Common have returned. On Tuesday, July 18th, the Burlington Rec Department is having Rampage Trio come perform on the Town Common as part of the Summer Concert Series. The Rampage Trio is a high-energy blues rock boogie dance band featuring singer-guitarist Brian Owens, singer-bassist Johnny Rome, and singer-harmonica player-drummer Kevin Crowley. The concerts begin at 6.30 p.m. Everyone is welcome, and the event is free. For more info, visit burlingtonrecreation.org or call 781-270-1695. Ready, set, cook. On Wednesday, July 19th from 5 to 7 p.m., Sonia Rollins, executive co-chair of the Burlington Area Chamber of Commerce, will go head-to-head -head with Atria chef John Riley in Atria's Chef Showdown 2017 at Atria Longmeadow, where the secret ingredient is corn. Come join the fun and get to taste some creative and delicious dishes. Everyone is welcome. Admission fee is a donation of a school supply that will support Telfus, a local nonprofit. For more info and to RSVP, email roseanne.matteo at hsseniorliving.com or visit burlingtonareachamberofcommerce.org. Finally, a local Burlington landmark will be celebrating a special anniversary this year. On Sunday, July 23rd, from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., the United Church of Christ Congregational is celebrating their 285th anniversary this year. There will be a special worship service at 9.30 a.m., then a summer barbecue and music at 11.30 a.m. Everyone is welcome to attend. For more information, call 781-272-4547 or visit www.uccburlington.org. This has been your community calendar. I'm Ian Castiola. Back to you in the studio. With the hot summer weather forecast, we caught up with COA Director Marge McDonald, who has some tips on how to stay cool and safe in the extreme heat and perhaps check up on your elderly neighbors. Let's have a look. Hi, I'm Marge McDonald, Director at the Burlington Council on Aging. With summer comes heat and there are certain precautions you will want to take. It sounds silly, but make sure you are wearing sunscreen. It's amazing how much hotter the sun feels when you aren't wearing protection. On really hot days, stay out of the sun between 10 and 2 and if you can, take a break from working during that time. Make sure you are hydrating. In other words, make sure you are drinking enough. Water is best, but juice or any decaffeinated drink other than alcohol will do. If you start to feel weak, start getting a headache or feel your heart racing, sit down in the shade or if you can, an air conditioned room and have a cold drink of water. If you don't begin to feel better quickly, call 911. Heat stroke and exhaustion are nothing to fool around with. If you don't have air conditioning and your house gets too hot, 
The mall is open seven days a week, most of the day, and until 9 p.m., 7 p.m. on Sundays. The library is open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The Senior Center is open the same hours as Town Hall. And don't forget to check on your neighbors. Thank you. Last weekend saw the premiere of Sony and Marvel Studios' new film, Spider-Man Homecoming. This is the third iteration of Spider-Man on the big screen, but that's not stopping moviegoers from seeing it. In the latest edition of B News Entertainment Buzz, B News Entertainment reporter Chris Flaherty swung over to AMC Theaters in Burlington and spoke to the fans to get a grasp on their anticipation for this film. Let's listen. Hi, everybody. Chris Flaherty here at the AMC Theaters in Burlington, and tonight is the opening night for Spider-Man Homecoming. Now this is the third time Spider-Man has been put to screen. He was once played in a series of films by Tobey Maguire and directed by Sam Raimi, and in another series of films directed by Mark Webb and portrayed by Andrew Garfield. But what's so different about this new film starring Tom Holland? Well, this is the first time Spider-Man has been in the same continuity as the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which basically means he can now hang out with the Avengers, like Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man and Chris Evans' Captain America. But does that mean this will be the best Spider-Man film ever? Well, let's go talk to some fans and see what they think. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. I can't wait. Scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you for this movie? 12. 12. So you're a big Spider-Man fan? Ever since I was like 3. Scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you for Homecoming? Um, I'd say eight. Eight. All right, talk to me about that. Why is it not a ten? Um, I mean, I, Spider-Man is my super favorite hero. Mm -hmm. Favorite superhero, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a completely crazy Marvel fan, so I would not give my, give this movie a ten. Um, but I'm pretty excited about it. What did you think of, um, this Spider-Man's first appearance in Civil War? I loved it. Um, just kind of seeing Civil War was cool in itself, but then Spider-Man comes and steals the show. It was was dope. In the other ones, it was cool just because I like Spider-Man so much, but now seeing him play with all the other characters is a lot of fun. He plays an amazing Spider-Man. Like, he really portrays, like, an actual high school student and, like, how excited they would be if, like, they were to actually meet the Avengers. And, like, he's always just, like, totally, like, fanboying about the fact that Tony Stark is, like, inviting him to fight Captain America, so it's awesome. Have you seen the older movies with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield? Yes. Yes, I have. You said that with some displeasure in your tone. T talk to me about that. Tobey Maguire has a terrible crying face. He does. He's not much of a dancer either. Terrible dancer as well. Would you rather Spider-Man 3 or Amazing Spider-Man 2? I actually only saw part of Amazing Spider-Man 2. That's how like much I didn't want to watch the rest of that film. And I think Spider-Man 3 is, might be so bad, it might actually be hilarious to go back and watch it. So I think I'm going to go with Spider-Man 3. They're so old and dated. They're like, yeah. they're fun to laugh at they at this are. point. Especially like the CGI effects and some of the like Spider-Man, the original. Yeah. So everyone's pretty excited to see their favorite web slinger back on the big screen and hanging out with Iron Man. Now, as this is airing, the movie will have already been out in theaters for a week. Hook us up on Twitter and let us know what you thought of the movie. Until next time, this is Chris Flaherty for B News Weekly. And remember, no spoilers. If you've already seen Spider-Man Homecoming, you might want to check out the new comedy, The House, starring Burlington's own Amy Poehler. Poehler co-stars with her fellow SNL cast member, cast member Will Ferrell, as per parents who start up an illegal underground casino to raise money for their daughter's college tuition after her scholarship falls through. Good luck with that, Amy. Another week, another photo to highlight. This week's photo was a bit of an adventurous encounter. Uh, two coyote pups can be seen wandering the town of Burlington. It was sent in by Pedro Rodriguez and shows the coyotes wandering through his backyard in the middle of the day. Uh, Mama Coyote can't be too far away. Thank you for the photo, Pedro. We'd like to see your photos. They could be of something you see around town, the weather outside your own door, or even photos of your family members and pets. Whatever you think is interesting and would like to share with us and the community. Mail, email your photos to bcat at bcattv.org with the subject line, Photo of the Week. Finally, we conclude this with some sad news. George E. Garland, a longtime resident of Burlington and a fixture here at BCAT, passed away last Thursday. Uh, he was at uh, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. George was 80 years old, a native of Wakefield. George moved to Burlington in 1964 with his wife, Barbara and worked for many years as a graphic designer. In 1970, he owned his own graphic design company, 
Garland Graphics. George was a key member of the Burlington community. He was a regular at True North, where he could often be seen chatting with friends. He was also a member of the Masons and was also a member of and commander, former commander of the Burlington DAV, William Hurley Chapter 113, an organization which he cared about very deeply. George also brought his unique talents to BCAT for many years as a producer and host of programs like All About Freemasons, Masonic News, and the True North series. He was always available to crew for productions when needed. George is survived by his wife, Barbara, whom he was married to for 57 years and has multiple grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We here at BCAT offer our condolences to George's family during this difficult time. You can find the full obituary at www.bcattv.org forward slash bnews. That's it from the news desk here at B News Weekly. I'm Phil Gallagher, along with B News reporters Chris Flaherty, Robert Parrish, Peter Brown with the weather, and Ian Cassiola with the community calendar. Thank you for joining us.